Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here today as we recognize Convention Days virtually with the Women's Rights National Park. Before I begin the talk first, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee peoples and to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. So I'm guessing that if you're watching this today, you know who this is. It is, of course, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, seen here with her longtime friend and partner in activist work, Susan B. Anthony. And as you are here watching, you probably already know a little bit about Stanton. You might be aware that she said some pretty controversial things over the course of her long public activist career. She said that married women should be able to own their own property. She argued that women shouldn't have to wear constricting corsets, a metal cage, and 20-something pounds of long, heavy skirts if they didn't wish to. She believed that the Christian Bible was problematic for women, so she re-envisioned its language and adapted the text to be more gender inclusive. This is still pretty incredibly radical. She argued that the activities and minds of all people should not be defined nor confined by their gender identity. And yet, these controversial ideas aren't the only ones Stanton held. Throughout her life, and most vocally and dramatically in the period between 1867 and 1869, Stanton repeatedly proclaimed the conviction that a person's class and race both defined and confined them. In particular, Stanton said and wrote elitist statements that stereotyped African Americans, Asian Americans, Irish Americans, poor Americans, and all immigrants, depicting them as inferior intellectually, socially, and personally to white upper-class American women like herself. I'd like to read you just one example. This is taken from a speech in January of 1869 that Stanton gave while Congress was considering the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which said that the right to vote could not be restricted by race. She said, quote, If American women find it hard to bear the oppressions of their own Saxon fathers, the best orders of manhood, what may they not be called to endure when all the lower orders of foreigners now crowding our shores legislate for them and their daughters? Think of Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Young Tung, who cannot read the Declaration of Independence or Webster's spelling book, making laws for Lucretia Mott, Ernestine Rose, and Anna E. Dickinson. It is an open, deliberate insult to American womanhood to be cast down under the iron-heeled peasantry of the old world and the slaves of the new. And this is, truthfully, among some of the more mildly racist things she said. I'll get to the darker stuff shortly. This racism was not simply an artifact of her moment. It was not a common reflection of a generalized background racism that has been and continues to be an ongoing plague in America. In fact, when Stanton was at her worst, numerous contemporary colleagues, both black and white, called her out for her racism and elitism. Given this, then, we have to understand that Stanton made a deliberate choice again and again to write and publish explicitly racist statements and ideas. In so doing, she threw away decades of intersectional alliances and friendships to advocate for suffrage for white women and white women only. Stanton's racist choices placed racist ideas at the heart of the women's suffrage movement. This practice carried through in powerfully exclusionary ways into the 20th century. There are many stories I could tell to illustrate this, but here's just one brief example of how racism in the suffrage movement operated well beyond Stanton's time. In 1913, Alice Paul and the National American Woman Suffrage Association were organizing a massive parade akin to the Women's March to be held in Washington, DC. Black suffragists in the Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago asked to participate. Founded by the renowned journalist and anti-lynching activist Ida Barnett Wells, the Black women in the Alpha Suffrage Club had been working for decades for suffrage rights for all women. But the white parade organizers told the club that its members were only welcome at the end of the parade to maintain racial segregation and appease white Southern suffragists. But Ida Wells refused to bow to racism. And so while other members of the Alpha Suffrage Club did march at the back of the parade alongside many other Black women suffragist groups, Ida waited on the sidelines of the parade for her state's group to pass. When they did, 
She stepped into the street and joined the white Illinois delegation as they walked by. That Wells, despite her national fame and prominence, was rejected by the parade's leaders and forced to illicitly claim space for herself as a suffrage activist makes plain how central racism was to the movement. This is only one of many incidents and ideas and moments that make it abundantly clear both that racism was endemic and that the suffrage movement was focused exclusively on the interests and needs of white women only. This may or may not be news to any of you. It certainly isn't news to historians and students of women's suffrage, nor is it news to people of color who have for decades been calling out the legacy of racism in the women's rights and contemporary feminist movements. That said, openly, explicitly, and widely acknowledging the racism of these feminist foremothers hasn't been a consistent part of our popular narrative about the suffrage movement. And this is a problem that we have to grapple with. So in the rest of my time, I'd like to walk you through some of the ways I've been thinking about this issue lately, and hopefully offer you some tools, some from historians like me, some from other more unlikely sources, but tools for helping us all to grapple with our complicated, always messy and often ugly past. The rest of my talk is divided into three sections. First, I'm going to offer some interpretive frameworks for helping us think about Stanton's racism. Then I want to lay out why I think she turned to racism as a political tool in the late 1860s. And ultimately, I want to share some ideas with you about the ways to talk about and think about this racism within the context of the 19th Amendment centennial and in the light of very recent current events. Right now, we are in the midst of an unprecedented national reckoning with our past. There's a growing national recognition among white Americans of just how deeply embedded racism is in American practices, institutions, and ideologies. A recognition, let me add, that has always been present in Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, and immigrant communities. And there's a surge of will to bring about transformative change right now. But this moment of reckoning right now has also pointed us to the way Americans engage with their past. We are finally undertaking a long overdue reassessment of who we lift up, lift up as historical heroes and why. We're rethinking what and who we choose to honor in our public spaces and why those honors were given. Given this, it is a timely moment to think about how we talk about white women suffragists who have profoundly problematic records on racial equality people like Stanton. Stanton and other white suffragists who espoused racist views pose a problem for us, mainly because we cannot deny that at times these women were passionate advocates for human equality. Stanton herself spent half a century using her profound intellect and vast power with words, working to transform the ways that Americans thought about and acted upon gender in law, ideology, religion, politics, and culture. Because of this, we cannot simply reject her legacy as tainted and ignore her as an important figure in early feminism. In terms my students might use, I don't think we should cancel Stanton. So then what do we do? How do we hold on to both Stanton's racism and her equal rights activism? Well, I'd like to begin offering my answer to this admittedly thorny problem with two ways of thinking about it. One comes from improvisational theater via feminist comedian Tina Fey, and the other from my professional discipline of history. These two things are admittedly pretty far from each other, so please bear with me for a minute here, okay? First, improv. In Tina Fey's memoir, Bossy Pants, she says that one of the most important rules of improvisational comedy is that you never say no to an idea that someone has raised in an improv situation. Instead, you say yes and, then begin to build upon the idea. So if your improv partner says, I'm a bear, you don't say, no, you're not, because that's the end of the comedy show. Instead, you say, yes, and let's go eat those hikers. They look delicious. Recently, some business leadership seminars have taken up the idea of yes and and used it as a critical tool for guiding difficult conversations and disagreements in the workplace. So a conversation in an office might go something like this. Person number one says, here's my idea for the company. Person number two should say, yes and we should also think about this thing that could impact your idea. 
This both validates the original idea and offers input as supplement rather than critique. Yes, and it seems to even be entering into our popular lexicon if graffiti is any judge. This appeared last fall on a bridge between my house and my daughter's school, riffing on my town's motto. So by now you might be thinking, how is this relevant to Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Well, if we ask the question, is Stanton a racist? Two very common responses are no, or more likely, yes, but. But I don't think either of these work as a fulfilling answer to the question. Those who might answer no willfully and harmfully ignore the overwhelming preponderance of evidence. Those who say yes, but, and then proceed to explain away what she said and did, elide the significance of her racism, shut all people of color out of the conversation about the history of women's rights, and implicitly defend Stanton for what is ultimately indefensible. But this is where Tina Fey helps us out. I think the real answer is yes, and. Fey says that when you respond to something with yes, and, you then have, quote, a responsibility to contribute, to add something to the conversation. And here's where my historical training kicks in. I don't think it's enough for us just to say Stanton is a racist or white suffragists were racist and then dismiss their work and their ideas. I think instead we have an obligation to contribute to the discussion, to help us better understand white suffragists like Stanton, to understand their ideas, their motivations, and their worldview, even if and perhaps because we find their racist choices abhorrent. This is very much keeping in line with the purpose of history. Historians seek to understand the people in the past where they were. We try to understand why people made the choices that they did and what cultural, political, and social influences may have shaped those choices. For it is in assessing those choices that we figure out who we are in relationship to the past, and therefore we can better understand and define our own values. So I'd like to suggest that if we think about white suffragists' racism through the yes and model, it better helps us to contextualize the movement. And this in turn enables us both to hold white suffragists accountable for their actions and to better understand the movement more broadly. For the rest of my talk today, I'd like to engage and share my answers to the yes and question for Elizabeth K. Stanton. My first book, Suffrage Reconstructed, focuses in particular on Stanton's racism in the 1860s, so her choices are the ones I know best. First, I'd like to explain what is going on for Stanton in the 1860s, then I'll argue that she chose racist language to fit in with the broader culture of party politics in the post-Civil War era. Finally, I'll discuss some of the consequences of that racist speech for the women's rights movement in the 1860s and beyond, and offer a model for how to grapple with racism in the suffrage movement as we go forward. Before I proceed, though, a couple of notes. First, when quoting directly, I retain all of the original language. Even though many of the terms the sources I use that refer to Black Americans are considered offensive today, the language they used was considered polite and acceptable at the time. Second, the talk does contain some brief discussions of sexual assault and lynching. Please practice good self-care if these things are triggering for you. So before I dig into Stanton's racist choices, the first thing I need to do is tell you about what's going on for Stanton in the 1860s. This will help us understand why her most explicit and graphic racist statements come out in this period. In particular, I want to ask, what on earth was going on with her and with the political world around her that made her think racist speech might be politically useful and acceptable? Well, we know, of course, that Stanton had been engaged in women's rights activism consistently from 1848 onward. But during the Civil War, Northern women's rights activists agreed to set aside all women's equality claims in order to work for the abolition of slavery. Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner said that the anti-slavery petitions that Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucy Stone collected were the key to tipping the political balance in Congress for the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. Because of this work, Stanton believed that the help she provided the Republican Party leadership in this period would translate into support for women's equality after the war, the kind of political quid pro quo standard in American politics, both then and now. So I wanna pause right here for a moment and explain a little bit about the American party system for those of you who aren't familiar with this part of our history. 
At this point in time, Republicans in the 1860s were the party that supported more extensive federal power and control. They believed there should be more government intervention in the economy, particularly through the federal government. And they were also considered the more socially liberal party, even if they did not broadly support full racial equality. Democrats, on the other hand, believed that most power should be at the state and local levels, that government should stay out of the economy, and they absolutely opposed anything that even hinted at racial equality. So while you'll hear me say Republicans and Democrats and the rest of the talk today, try to keep in mind that they are not the same thing as our current political parties. And I'll try to remind you about this occasionally as I go along. So given that Stanton had done important work during the Civil War, work that helped the Republican Party goal of achieving abolition, she really believed that Republicans would advocate women's equality. And truthfully, the immediate post-Civil War period did look particularly hopeful for all women's rights. Because reconstructing the nation fundamentally required a wide-ranging reassessment of political citizenship. Should Southern white men who had made war on the nation be permitted to vote? When? Under what conditions? Should newly emancipated men be permitted to vote? Again, under what conditions? What about all women? All of these questions were at the forefront of national political conversations that started even before the Civil War ended. But between 1865 and 1866, they were openly debated by members of Congress. In particular, Republicans sought to protect both their party's power and formerly enslaved people in the South. They started to believe that they could accomplish both by giving Southern Black men the ballot. In light of this political shift, Stanton reasoned that this was also the optimal time to enfranchise all women. But what Stanton hadn't reckoned on, or at least what she wildly underestimated, was the power of gender in the politics of Reconstruction. Consistently, throughout the immediate post-war period, congressional Republicans relied heavily on gender-based arguments to justify enfranchising Southern Black men. In particular, Republicans, echoing the arguments long made by Black activists, claimed that Black men had earned their manhood on the field of battle in the Civil War. As men, therefore, Black men should possess the ballot as did all other adult men in America. Stanton, nevertheless, worked to persuade Republicans that all women needed the ballot as urgently as Southern Black men. Especially through a petition campaign in 1866, she and Anthony hoped to shift congressional Republicans toward women's voting rights. But in early 1866, the Republican-led Congress added the word male to the 14th Amendment to define voters. This introduced gender-specific language to the Constitution for the first time. It was a crushing blow and a deliberate and explicit rejection of woman suffrage. As the post-war years went on, Stanton suffered further losses to her cause. First, New York, her home state, repudiated women's suffrage in its 1867 Constitutional Convention. Although Stanton and Anthony had personally appeared before the convention's suffrage committee, it rejected their arguments because it declared that women's enfranchisement would, quote, involve transformations so radical in social and domestic life that no New Yorker would accept it. But the last straw for Stanton happened in Kansas. In 1868, legislators in the state of Kansas proposed two referenda for the fall ballot, one enfranchising black men in the state and one enfranchising all women. Excited by the possibility that Midwesterners might see the value of women as voters, Stanton and Anthony both went on a statewide speaking tour, making their case directly to Kansan voters. But both referenda were soundly defeated. Discouraged, brokenhearted, feeling abandoned by former allies, and running low on funds, Stanton and Anthony then got an interesting offer they felt they could not refuse. And it came from an extremely unlikely source, a Democrat. So remember, 19th century Democrats were the social conservatives. So who was this Democrat and why did he try to help Stanton and Anthony? Well, his name was George Francis Train and he was a railroad financier, wealthy enough to be funding his own private run for the presidency. Train had come to Kansas late in the referenda campaign to stump the state for women's voting rights. He spoke alongside Stanton and Anthony at some events and apparently liked what he heard. 
So in November of 1867, after the defeat of the referenda, Train offered to fund a women's rights newspaper for Stanton and Anthony to manage and edit. They embraced the support wholeheartedly. It's hard to underestimate the importance of a newspaper to the suffragists at this point. It would provide them an independent public voice, control over their messaging, and was a potentially massive source of publicity for their movement. Perhaps even more importantly, though, the historian Faye Dunn has argued, it would have provided women's rights activists with a steady source of funding, independent from Republicans and abolitionists, something they desperately needed. Newspapers at this point were big money. It would be like handing someone a dot-com startup in the 1990s. But Stanton and Anthony's decision to accept Train's money was a decidedly controversial move. Train, aside from being a wealthy political semi-celebrity, was also unapologetically racist. He had come to Kansas explicitly to argue that expanding the franchise to include black men required the inclusion of white women to create a balance in the political community. Many of Stanton and Anthony's longtime allies rejected Train because of this racism, and they soundly criticized the two women for their willingness to accept his help. Here's just one example. In a letter to Anthony, abolitionist leader William Lloyd Garrison wrote, I cannot refrain from expressing my regret and astonishment that you and Mrs. Stanton should have taken such leave of good sense and departed so far from true self-respect as to be traveling companions and associate lecturers with that crack-brained harlequin and semi-lunatic. He is as destitute of principle as he is of sense. He may be of use in drawing an audience, but so would a kangaroo, a gorilla, or a hippopotamus. But all Stanton and Anthony saw was the opportunity Train had offered with the newspaper. They named the paper he funded the Revolution because they said its purpose was, quote, to revolutionize, as it advocated for, quote, educated suffrage irrespective of sex or color, equal pay to women for equal work, eight hours labor, abolition of standing armies, and party despotisms. Down with politicians, the first issue proclaimed, and up with the people. Even back then, Americans hated their politicians. But in the pages of the revolution, Stanton often articulated a very exclusive vision of the people, saying some of the most blatantly racist statements of her career. But why? Why did Stanton turn to racism in the revolution to argue for white women's voting rights when she had not done so as widely or as openly before? What prompted her to make this choice? The answer lies, I think, in party politics. In this period, Stanton carefully and deliberately appropriated the racist partisan political rhetoric of the 19th century Democratic Party. And I think she did so in order to attract Democrats to the woman suffrage cause. In other words, Stanton didn't pull her racist language from thin air. Point for point, the arguments that she made that were most disturbing were taken directly from Democratic Party ideas and Democratic partisan rhetoric. So remember, as I said earlier, in the 19th century, the Democratic Party was the more socially conservative party. Its constituents were drawn mostly from rural white farmers and urban working and lower class native born white Americans, as well as white European immigrants, all of whom were openly hostile to African Americans in this period. So therefore, Democrats defined themselves and their party as the party of quote, white man's government. This was a widely used party motto and campaign slogan repeated again and again by 19th century Democrats. Throughout the post-Civil War period, Reconstruction, Democrats' racism can be clearly seen in Congress. In particular, Congressional Democrats argued three racist things about voting rights, all of which had implications for white women that Stanton would seek to capitalize on. First, they claimed that voting was not a right to which all citizens were entitled. Second, they argued that whiteness was an essential and necessary quality for a voter to possess. And third, they argued that if black men were given the ballot, it would endanger America. So let's break these arguments down. Congressional Democrats in 1865 and 1866 argued that voting was not an inherent right belonging to all Americans. To make this argument, they looked to women. Because women did not vote, Democrats claimed, suffrage must therefore be neither a natural right nor a right of citizenship. For example, Representative John Chandler of New York argued that, quote, the right to vote is not an 
The right to vote is not an inalienable right. It is not a natural right at all. Women, minors, and aliens are excluded from its exercise. Yet no disgrace attaches to them in being deprived of the privilege to vote, nor is it any injustice committed on them. It is rather, he said for women, an honor to them that they sweeten this constraint, an honor to them that they suffer this constraint which sweetens liberty. Democrats were not so bold as to argue that the lack of the ballot sweetened liberty for black men. They did, however, reject the idea that black men were capable of possessing political privileges, even if they were entitled to some basic civil rights, and they grounded this argument in racism. For example, on June 16, 1866, Indiana Representative William Nye Black declared, the Negro race is inferior to the white race and anything like social or political equality between the two races is neither practical nor desirable. Senator James Doolittle of Wisconsin echoed this argument. We are Caucasians, he said, and represent that race. When a man tells me that the Africans in this country just set free on the plantations are competent to exercise the right of suffrage and help shape the laws of this great republic, he states what is perfectly abhorrent to my sense of justice, reason, or propriety. Depicting black men in this racist way, Democrats drew on Americans' fears about the inherent safety of their democracy. Democrats claimed that extreme danger would result if the ballot was extended to black men. Indiana Representative Michael Kerr argued that not only was the nation's safety threatened by black men's enfranchisement, but that whiteness itself would be endangered by black voters. Quote, we may thus become substantially Africanized, Mexicanized, or Cooleyized, and all our glorious institutions and national and personal individuality give place to anarchy and weakness. Given the recent civil war, national safety was of particular concern. In light of this, Democrats argued that the on only just reunited union could not handle any expansion of the franchise. Senator Garrett Davis of Kentucky argued that, quote, Negro suffrage is political arsenic. The tranquility, prosperity, and freedom of a country depend much upon the homogeneousness of its people. A race of people that is essentially inferior to the Caucasian race should never have any political power conferred on it. If the presence of black men in the body politic would threaten the national safety, Democrats also claimed then that black male voters would threaten the personal safety of individual Americans. And this is where things get profoundly ugly. In particular, Democrats asserted that the safety of white women was being determined by the enfranchisement debates. They argued that enfranchisement would inappropriately empower black men and give them license to perpetrate sexual violence against Southern women. While making these arguments about the potential danger of black men as voters, some Democrats sacrificed their adherence to traditional gender roles to argue that voting rights and whiteness were so connected that white women would be better and safer voters than black men. For example, Pennsylvania Democrat Benjamin Boyer suggested that given Republican arguments, then white women should perhaps vote. Quote, if the Negro has a natural right to vote because he is a human inhabitant of a community professing to be Republican, then women should vote for the same reason. Some of the reformers do say that after the Negro will come the women, but I protest against this inverse order of merit, and if both are to vote, I claim precedence for the ladies. Ladies, to him, clearly meant only white women. Other Democrats also deemed white women worthy voters explicitly because of their whiteness. In December of 1866, Pennsylvania Senator Edgar Cowan suggested that educated white women as voters could be a viable solution to the, quote, problem of, quote, dangerous black male voters. Quote, I say you have not demonstrated that it is safe to give the ballot to black men, but Republicans are determined to do it. And I want to put along with that debased element, that element just emerged from slavery. I want you to put along with it into the ballot box to neutralize its poison, if poison there be, to correct its dangers, if danger there be, the female element of the country. Note here again as well, black women are most definitely not a part of Cowan's equation. So if we take these arguments all together, we can see that throughout the period between 1866 and 1868, 
numerous Democrats were openly and publicly advocating enfranchising white women in suffrage-related debates and using racism in order to make that argument. So that brings us back to Stanton. As an avid follower of American politics and savvy politician herself, Stanton was aware that Democrats were making these claims and saw in those arguments the potential alliance the Democratic Party seemed to be offering for white women. In the second issue of the revolution, Stanton reached out for that connection. In an editorial entitled, Who Are Our Friends? She defended her decision to affiliate with Democrats. A party out of power, she said, is always in a position to carry principles to their logical conclusions, while the party in power thinks only of what it can afford to do. Hence, you can reason with minorities while majorities are moved only by votes. To reason with the minority Democrats, Stanton began to echo Democratic partisan rhetoric, and in so doing, used racism strategically to advance the claims of white women to the ballot. First, just like Democrats, Stanton occasionally deemed black men too ignorant to hold the ballot and protested the, quote, elevation of such men to a political status above that of educated white women. Like Democrats, Stanton rejected this potential reordering. For example, in a January editorial, Stanton declared, quote, what a depth of degradation must the women of this nation have fallen to be willing to stand aside, silent and indifferent spectators in the reconstruction of the nation, while all the lower stratas of manhood are to legislate in their interests, political, religious, educational, social, and sanitary, molding to their untutored will the institutions of a mighty continent. What an insult to the women who have labored 30 years for the emancipation of the slave, now when he is their political equal, to propose to lift him above their heads. Here Stanton envisioned a social hierarchy that valued race above gender, and like the Democrats, she implied that black men were incapable of either voting wisely or governing effectively. Note here also how she conflated white women with all women, erasing black women from her view. In May of 1868, Stanton restated this argument more explicitly and in a more overtly racist way. Stanton stated that she saw the women of virtue, wealth, and character in this country were to be made the subjects of every vicious, ignorant, degraded type of manhood. So we unfurled the new banner to the breeze, immediate and unconditional enfranchisement for women of the Republic. By suggesting that black men were, quote, vicious, ignorant, and degraded, Stanton disputed both their fitness for the ballot and the justice of privileging their rights over the rights of upper-class educated white women. This assertion was clearly designed to resonate with the deepest fears of Democrats, who Stanton may have hoped she could convert to the cause of white women's voting rights. Second, Stanton, like the Democrats, argued that black men's lack of education rendered their enfranchisement dangerous to the ideological and physical safety of the nation. And like the Democrats, Stanton positioned white women as a solution to this potential hazard. For example, in January of 1868, Stanton argued that the only safe way for the nation lay in the abilities of its voters. Quote, to trust the lowest stratum of manhood to legislate on the political, moral, and social interests of the nation is suicidal to our free institutions. To protect those free institutions, Stanton claimed it was necessary to enfranchise white women. Universal suffrage is safe, she said, because you have the wealth, the virtue, the education of women to outweigh ignorance, poverty, and vice. But to extend suffrage to ignorant manhood is to invert the natural order of things. It is to dethrone the queen of the moral universe and subjugate royalty to brute force. In claiming that women's votes would protect the nation, Stanton's language here hinted at the final insidious, democratically influenced argument that giving black men the ballot would result in the sexual endangerment of white women. A week later, however, her argument became more explicit. Disparaging the passage of black men's suffrage rights in Washington, D.C., Stanton stated that, quote, in removing all political disabilities from the male citizens of the district, Congress has established a government based on the aristocracy of sex invading as it does our homes, desecrating our family altars, dividing those whom God has joined together, and subjugating everywhere moral power to brute force. The verbs she chose to use in these statements are particularly telling. While desecrate and invade are sufficiently suggestive, subjugate explicitly means to conquer, to bring under the power of another, 
to make submissive and to subdue. In case this coded language was lost on some of her readers, in the same issue of the newspaper, Stanton articulated her meaning in less ambiguous terms. Quote, just as the democratic cry of white man's government created the antagonism between the Irishman and the Negro, which culminated in the New York riots of 63, so the Republican cry of manhood suffrage creates an antagonism between black men and all women that will culminate in fearful outrages on womanhood, especially in the Southern states. Just as Democrats had utilized the myth of the black male rapist to define black men as unworthy voters, Stanton also drew on this racist fiction to create a reason for women's voting, for white women's voting, that carried sufficient emotional power. Without the immediate and palpable threat of violence against white women to push her suffrage argument, violence like black men and women were experiencing in the South, white women's claim to need the vote lacked sufficient political and moral power. But suggesting that white women were endangered by black male voters lent weight to their ostensible need for the protection of the ballot. This was probably the ugliest moment in Stanton's political rhetoric. In making this argument, Stanton grounded white women's voting rights in a racist myth that was ultimately responsible for the brutally violent murder of tens of thousands of black Americans, as it was used from the 1860s onward to justify lynching. It is a violent myth that still echoes through American policing and incarceration systems. We simply cannot hear those words without condemning Stanton for writing them. And we wouldn't be the first to condemn her. Stanton's racist appeals to the Democrats alienated many of her former allies in the 1860s. It was a key factor in driving Frances Watkins Harper, Frederick Douglass, and Lucy Stone to reject Stanton and form the American Woman Suffrage Association. It supported enfranchising black men first, and once that goal was achieved, then working toward giving the ballot to all women. At the same time, Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women Suffrage Association, which insisted that women be enfranchised immediately. This organizational split, along with Stanton's tactics, put black women activists, of whom there were many involved in the movement at this moment, in a particularly untenable position. Some black women suffrage advocates like Hattie Purvis Jr. and Sojourner Truth supported Stanton and Anthony's national organization. They felt that the goal of immediate enfranchisement of all adult Americans offered black women their best chance at equality. But other black activists like Hattie Fortin Purvis and Lottie Rowland allied with Harper, Douglas, and Stone and the American Women Suffrage Organization. Over time, however, with white suffragists' overt racism and indifference to black Americans' interests and ideas pushed black women activists to create their own organizations to advocate for their own equality. Stanton's choices also divided white suffrage activists and weakened the movement for the next 20 years. But the schism in the movement is, is in some ways the least significant of the impact of her decisions in the 1860s. Stanton's choices in the 1860s created a legacy of racism that was carried into the 20th century suffrage movement and American feminism more broadly. While I don't think we'd be inclined simply to forgive Stanton her racism, even if all women had been enfranchised as a result of her strategy, yet it seems particularly horrifying that for all of the pain and injustice, exclusion and animosity that her actions in this moment generated, Democrats in the 1860s were really no more interested in giving white women the ballot than were Republicans. Democrats found the idea of white women as voters politically useful in that it supported their racist opposition to black men's enfranchisement, as well as bolstering their, bolstering their race-based partisan identity grounded in whiteness. But they were simply not serious about giving every woman the ballot. It would take another 64 years for white women's voting rights to be secured. Stanton would not live to see it happen. But that was just the beginning. Chinese American immigrants could not vote until 1943, Japanese American immigrants until 1952. It would take even longer, almost a full century, for Black and Indigenous women's voting rights to be protected with the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And yet, even today, millions of American women's right and access to the ballot is threatened. So let's come back to Stanton herself. What do we do with what we now know about her? How do we hold on to our image of Stanton as an advocate for equality and to the knowledge that she willingly wielded racism as a political weapon when she felt it useful? <laughs>
I think the work of distinguished historian Ibram X. Kendi offers us a useful framework for doing this. In his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Kendi argues that we need to rethink how we understand the term racist. He explicitly defines racist as, quote, one who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea. By this definition, it is easy to identify moments when suffragists like Stanton were engaged in racist actions or where they expressed racist ideas. But Kendi goes further. He argues that the opposite of racist isn't not racist, that any attempt at neutrality in the face of racist policies or ideas is impossible. One either supports or opposes racist policy and ideas. Opponents of racist policy are anti-racists, people who support anti-racist policy. And here's the thing, these aren't permanent identities, they're choices. One has to choose to be a racist or an anti-racist, and it's an ongoing process of constant decision-making. Kendi says, quote, racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. One can be racist one minute and anti-racist the next. It all depends upon our choices. And here's where Kendi, I think, helps us understand Stanton and other white suffragists. In the 1860s, in many of her public moments, Stanton was racist. She made choices that supported racist policies and ideas. But at other moments in her life, both before and after the 1860s, she actively pursued policies that were anti-racist. So I'm suggesting that instead of viewing Stanton's racism as an expression of her identity, we have to instead think about it as a set of choices that she made. Thinking about it in this way, as a choice, as a decision, then gives us the space to try to understand that choice, to contextualize it, and then to hold it up as one particularly ugly piece of a whole and complex flawed human being. This helps us, I think, have a richer and more nuanced understanding of Stanton herself. And it also offers us a model for how to think about racist choices made by other people in the American past whose records are likewise complicated and troubling, whose histories blend anti-racist and racist choices and ideas. But we also need to do so much more to open up the popular narrative about the fight for women's equality. We can and should lift up the people who consistently advocated anti-racist and gender equality policies and ideas. Often, these were the people who were shut out of the suffrage movement because of their race or ethnicity. We should commemorate and celebrate activists like Frances Harper, who again and again throughout her long career called white women out for their racism and their blindness to the experiences and needs of Black American women. And Harper is just one among the thousands of women left out of the popular narrative whose stories are out there and have been out there for quite some time, who should be written back into the popular history of the women's equality movement. So as I said earlier, we are in a historic moment right now that offers so much potential for liberation and equality, even in the midst of all the challenges and hardships we are facing. I wonder if this is a bit like what the people who attended the Seneca Falls Convention may have felt all of the possibility for building a more just and equitable world in the midst of a set of profoundly oppressive institutions. Part of our work in this moment is to think carefully about our past, calling out, contextualizing, and rejecting the racist choices of the people who made them, and instead looking for and celebrating anti-racist choices and ideas wherever we find them. Right now, it's also particularly important to do this work because in August, we commemorate 100 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment. One of the key dangers of commemoration is our tendency to mythologize people in the past beyond the historical facts of their deeply flawed human lives. We want to hold on to our heroes, to think the people in the past were perfect, free from the common biases and ugly limitations that are all too common among our leaders and ourselves. And so we separate what we idolize about the person from the actual facts of their life. But if we embrace the whole story of our historic figures, it can disrupt blind devotion and belief in their perfection and help us to avoid a troubling and historically inaccurate myth-making. It enables us instead to recognize the full complexity of how people engaged with ideas in the past. And this, I think, ultimately strengthens our own values and goals by marking the points where we diverge. It offers us a way to think about our own complex decisions, our own racist and anti-racist choices, so that we can do better going forward.
Thank you for listening and watching today. I'd like to thank Stephanie Fries for inviting me to speak, and Janine Waller and Jason Wickersty for their technical assistance. I'd like to recognize the many park rangers who do the essential on-the-spot work of history at the Women's Rights National Park and who have ably adapted their project for a virtual moment. And finally, I'd like to thank the staff who maintain and clean the physical facilities of all our national parks, whose work too often goes unacknowledged. I'll look forward to an ongoing conversation with you all shortly. Thank you. Hello, my name is Janine Waller, and I am the Chief of Interpretation, Education, and Outreach at Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. This weekend, we are commemorating uh, the 1848 Women's Rights Convention that was held here at the Wesleyan Chapel, right on the Women's Rights National Historical Park property. And today, we have the honor of having Dr. Laura Free with us to do a live Q&A after her wonderful presentation on grappling with suffragist racism. So um, Dr. Laura Free is the Associate Professor of History at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dr. Free. Thanks, thanks Janine, I'm glad to be here. I just wanna um, first say that since my talk was pre-recorded, I did not yet know about the passing of Reverend C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis, and I would have added um, to the talk um, my respects to them and um, may they rest in power and may we continue their work. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the work that you do and what is your area of scholarly research and study? Yeah, sure. I, I'm a historian of um, politics and um, particularly the role of gender in American politics in the 19th century. Um, my first book, Suffrage Reconstructed, uh, was about ideas about gender and race and how they shaped the debates around voting rights after the U.S. Civil War. And through that research, um, I was I had always been, of course, interested in the suffrage movement because it's such an interesting moment when the American democracy grapples with who gets to belong, right? Um, and that's always a question that's fascinated me. And so um, looking through at the Reconstruction moment uh, brought me in many ways to uh, Stanton and to the suffrage movement. Yeah. Very Well, we're going to be taking questions now from our visitor, our virtual visitors, folks who were able to view your talk on YouTube. And I just want to let everyone know that they can put their comments in the, the comment section just below this video. You can also submit con comments through Facebook, our Facebook page, which is at Women's Rights NPS, um, all lowercase on Facebook. So we're, we're taking all kinds of questions. Um, and the, I want to sort of start with drawing some parallels between the convention that we are commemorating this weekend and your work. During your talk, you focused primarily on Stanson's work and the Reconstruction era in the, in the 1860s and, and after. Have you had a chance to apply the similar analysis to her earlier work, say, in the period of the convention? Yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you asked that, Janine. Actually, um, the my the project I'm currently working on is a podcast called Amended. Um, you can find it at amendedpodcast.com with Humanities New York. And our first episode is all about the Women's Rights Convention in 1848. And um, one of the things that really strikes me about the convention is there's a line in the Declaration of Sentiments that I think is a signpost for what's to come in the 1860s. When Stanton um, wrote about suffrage in the Declaration, she says um, that it's uh, it's it's a you know she's essentially saying it's a tragedy that women aren't given the right to vote when every ignorant and degraded type of manhood is given the, that right. And and 
that kind of language, I think, was coded language. She's showing some of her class bias here, some of her anti-immigrant bias, um, even as early as 1848. She makes those kinds of statements, that sort of ignorant and degraded language. She uses that periodically throughout the 1840s and 1850s. Um, but it's not really until Reconstruction that she starts to um, get super specific and super ugly, especially around black men um, in particular. And I think it's, it, it's tied to what's happening in that political moment that makes it um, seem like a meaningful political choice for her in that moment. But, you know, she's, she remains elitist throughout her life and um, the 1840s were no different. But she also has moments where she's got a more expansive vision of who belongs in the polity. But I think um, I think a lot of it sometimes comes down for her to this, like, what, I can't vote? You know, me? <laughs> I'm this, I'm wealthy, I'm educated, I have privilege, right? I think, I think it rankles her that all of her privilege as a white person, as a wealthy person, as um, an, uh, an educated person, and that that's not recognized by the state. And I think um, she then she often directs that in an outward way uh, toward people who are less privileged than she is um, in some and, and in some ways blames them and blames the system for the fact that they have this political power and she does not. Thank yeah. you. That's very insightful. Um, we have a question from a visitor. It says, uh, didn't some women in the US have the vote before Thomas Jefferson was president? Yes, absolutely. We know um, that there were women who voted. There was one woman in particular in colonial Massachusetts in the se uh, the 1700s who voted. She had um, was a widow who possessed a lot of property and had a very young son. And um, the community decided to have a vote on whether or not to participate in the American Revolution. And they decided it was very important for her to have a say in this as a property owner. Um, we know that women voted in New Jersey until 1807. Um, the, if they had, again, sufficient property. So early on in American history, the way that people understood the right to vote is that it was tied to one's um, possessions, essentially. How much wealth did you have? And that wealth entitled you to a stake in the community. Over time, especially after the American Revolution, a lot of white men without property argued that they participated in the revolution. They were soldiers. They fought for the country, but they didn't have, an, they didn't have any land. And it was land in particular that you had to possess. Um, and then at the same time, America is urbanizing, right? So so um, there are a, is a growing population of people who do not own a, a farm <laughs> to have enough land um, to vote. And so state constitutions, one after the other, over the course of the early half of the 19th century, start writing in language that says voters have to be male and that they have to be white. So um, there is was a strong, strong likelihood that African-American men with sufficient property in other places voted as well. Um, but uh, the, gradually over the course of that period, we know um, that uh, the property re restriction, the elimination of property restrictions pushed people out, even as it, it widened the, the, the participation field for white, um, for white men. So yes, uh, we don't have a whole lot of evidence of individual women who cast a ballot, um, but we know for sure the New Jersey Constitution even was very explicit. Um, one of the, the later laws says he or she in referencing voters before 1807. Great question, thanks. Um, another question is, we talk about the relationship between uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass as, as really breaking down very much after she employs this, this very nasty racist language. And it seems like they were caught in a dichotomy where they felt that only one or the other either black men or women and in, in her mind white women could have the vote how did they get caught up in that how did they get get caught up in the idea that it was one or the other that someone had to go first yeah, that's a really great question. I, I think the answer is party politics, right? Who controls access to the ballot? And those are the people who have it, the people who have power. And in the 19th century, um, those are white white men, right? White men have, have the right to vote in, in, in America. They are the men in Congress. They are the people with the power. And so after the Civil War, there is this national conversation about who should have the right to vote anyway, right? There's kind of this opening up of, 
how, um, what should that look like? Who should have it? Should we give it to white Southern men who just uh, came back from civil war? Do we give it to black men? Do we give it to all women? The the fact that they are having this conversation, they can, they're the gatekeepers, right? They control the access. And what they did was framed it so that what they felt was politically expedient was to give black Southern men the right to vote. And so um, they were making this a choice between either or. Both Stanton and Douglas preferred a, a more expansive vision. Um, and we see that in the organization they, that they found, founded, the American Equal Rights Association, right after the war. They, you know, the, its goal was, it, it, its, uh, its stated goal was, quote, to bury the black man and the woman in the citizen, right? They wanted everyone, if you're a citizen, to have the right to vote. But the political powers that be weren't allowing that kind of, um, of, of vision. They were saying, nope, it's only going to be about this little narrow slice. Um, I've always like speculated that if if there had been a wholesale reassessment of what it meant to vote, and if the vote had been given to all citizens as a right of citizenship in that moment, it could, it would have been potentially transformative. Because ultimately, even what the Fifteenth Amendment says, it said it doesn't say everyone has the right to vote regardless of race. It says you can't discriminate against people on the basis of race, color, previous condition of servitude. The Nineteenth Amendment does the same thing. It doesn't say everybody has the right to vote. It says you can't can't discriminate on the basis of sex. That leaves open all kinds of things like property taxes, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, um, literacy tests, all of those uh, nefarious means by which people are denied the ballot. And I think um, there, there was a great opportunity lost in this moment. And Douglas and Stanton had seen that opportunity. Um, and then the political system they were navigating just didn't allow the space for that in that moment. Okay, thank you. Um, you you mentioned many of the tools that were used to keep all, keep people away from the ballot box um, up until the the Voting Rights Act of 1964. So this is a a long one battle even between 1920 at the ratification of the 19th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act. Um, so you know there are uh, lots of people who were involved in bringing that um, those practices to an end, or at least to a minimum. Um, and, and so how do we tell the stories of those activists, particularly those um, black and indigenous and other people of color who contributed to that without appropriating their stories? How do we share their contributions? I, that's such a great question. And I think um, the first thing is that um, we have to listen to scholars of color. We have, um, and by we, I mean white scholars like me have to take a step back and say, what are scholars of color telling me? What what is their scholarship? This this work is out there. It's been out there for quite some time, and there's scholars who are doing amazing work on the contributions of Black Indigenous people of color to suffrage movement, to politics, to the effort to expand the right to vote. Um, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, um, oh, and and one of them who's doing amazing work and her book is about to come out in September, take a look uh, for it, is Martha, Martha Jones at Johns Hopkins. Her book is called Vanguard, and um, it's about Black women in the suffrage movement. Uh, I think it's going to be a really incredible book. Um, having a conversation with Martha for the podcast, and for the amended podcast, she said to me, when you, if you're doing history and in the story that you're telling, there are no Black women in the room, you have to ask yourself, where are they? what are they doing, right? Because they are out there and they are acting on behalf of their own interests and their own needs, and they are um, making a movement, making change. And so as a scholar, if you are not looking at that, you need, you need to be, you need to be. Um, and so I think, I think, uh, it, Anytime we're thinking about that, this history, we have to be asking ourselves those kinds of questions, all of us. And then I think the last thing we need to do is just shift our focus, move away from the white centered narrative that that concentrates on the ideas, the needs, the goals that white activists set for themselves and instead think about what are other people looking for? 
right? What do they need? Uh, Frances Harper here is a great example. In, in the women's rights meeting in 1866, she comes to this meeting and Stanton and, and everybody else is all there talking about when, you know, women need the right to vote. And, and Harper tells this story about being kicked off of a streetcar in Philadelphia because she was black, about being forced to ride in the smoking car, which was a, a male space, right? Because she was black. She had purchased a first class ticket on a train, could not ride in that carriage had got got sent back to this very dangerous male space. Um, and, and, and she says in this meeting, she says, all you white women here are talking about rights. I'm talking about wrongs. Right. She had been wronged. Um, and the, the white women in the room weren't really cluing into that. And she calls them out for that. So, you know, I think it's so important to look for those moments because they're there. They're right. They're right in front of us. Um, and, and those are the stories that need amplifying. I think that's a really long winded way to answer that question. I hope, uh, I hope that's OK. Yeah. Um, you know, you you are talking about a lot of things that are, are particularly sensitive to uh, many people right now. People are very invested in exploring the questions of race in our society, in our institutions, in particular, in who we celebrate and who we commemorate. And uh, in this convention days, we recognize that, you know, there there were no women of color that we're aware of present at the 1848 convention, neither present nor invited, and that Frederick Douglass was likely the only man of color who was also um, present in the room. So, so we're aware that this is an, an issue that dates back, you know, before Reconstruction, that, that there's a, a question of these voices being um, submerged. So we appreciate your your help in, in taking this to the next level and, and furthering our own conversation. We have a question from a visitor who says, you know, how are your positions in your analysis of this really complex history in this complex moment, how are they received? Do you get a lot of pushback and resistance to it? Do you get folks who are saying, no, history is what was written in the books? You know, how do people receive your, your work? That's a really great question. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been working on this for a really long time. It, this, this started as my dissertation. So, um, and I'm ancient now. So that was a long time ago. And when I first started talking about this stuff, um, I'd go to conferences and I'd present to a group of women's historians and I'd say, hey, Stanton was racist. We have to acknowledge this. And people would get really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. I think that um, for the early, for many of the earliest generation of women's historians, they worked so hard to carve out any little bit of space for the history of all women that it felt really threatening to them to, um, to talk about this. But these days, it, it, these days, it's 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 very well received. People are kind of like, well, yeah, duh, <laughs> right? Um, if we're talking about someone in the past, of course, um, they have made racist choices in their past. Um, that's not something that's very surprising anymore. So, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to think about in my own work, it felt very, very important to me uh, 20, 15, even 10 years ago to really drill into this and say, okay, so I want to show you exactly how Stanton is racist and to repeat her language and to share it again and again, that felt important to me. I think it's less important anymore. And in fact, I think it could even cause harm at this point. I think it's enough for us to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to show you a little bit how she's racist. And then now we're going to shift to the focus. Now we're going to move our, our attention away from the, the racist choices she made and start thinking about um, other choices that other people made that were anti-racist and so moving us away from that narrative. Um, but yeah, generally right right now, um, it, it is it is not it is not even controversial anymore, I think, to say this. Yeah. You you started to talk about this, but we, we have another question um, about given the complexity and flaws in Stanton's activism, what ultimately is her legacy? Um, you know, we, we had talked a little bit about that in terms of, um, you know, are, are we allowed to have heroes anymore? How do we recognize these these and other problematic people as if there were unproblematic people? The, 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 the people that, that are problematic in our history that we want to somehow idolize or celebrate, what should their legacy be? What is Stanton's legacy? 
Yeah, that's a really good, uh, I'm saying this to all, all the questions, aren't I? It's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they are, they're all really great questions. You know, I think um, one of the things that I think is a real problem with um, idolizing people in the past is that it holds us up to an impossible standard. Right. If we fail to recognize the flaws, the complexity, the ugliness, um, the the racist choices, if we if we set those aside and say, OK, we're going to ignore that bit, and we're only going to hold up uh, this amazing work that people did. Um, that makes it impossible for us to live up to. Right. How do we as deeply flawed human beings engage in any work whatsoever? I can't live up to that. I'm not perfect. Um, I th so I think it's it's really important to acknowledge the full complexity of people in the past and to try as hard as we can to hold on to both the things that we value right now and to acknowledge and call out the things that we don't. I think that if we um, ignore either of those things, it it um, it does it does us all a disservice, really, um, both to our past and to our present and our future. I think in terms of her legacy, I think think, um, I'm not even sure that's how I would think about it. I think I would think about what values did she espouse that I find meaningful and that I find worth fighting for? And what values did she espouse that I think we need to let go of or, in fact, actively fight against? And um, I, I think that's how I would think about it. And I think that's how I would think about all historic figures in the past, because everyone is complicated and not everyone makes good choices at every moment. Right. Um, that said, there are some public commemorations that I think we need to undo. Right. Um, I think uh, removing statues of Confederates who fought um, in a treasonous war against this country to uh, continue to enslave other people. Yeah, I, I think it's time we stop celebrating them. But I think it's time that we also continue to acknowledge they were they were important figures in the past. They did some stuff that we should know about, but we don't need to continue to celebrate it. So, you know, I, I was talking to um, Valerie Paley, who's the head of the New York Historical Society the other day, and we were talking about this problem of commemoration. And, you know, the possibilities are really endless for what we commemorate and how. We don't have to have statues of people. We can we can, we can choose values, we can choose groups, we can choose images, we can choose ideas. And I think I think maybe that's where I would go with Stanton's legacy is what are the ideas that were amazing that she had that we value and that align closely with things that we want to keep fighting for? Thank you for that. Thank you for touching on those those really pertinent questions. Um, I think our, our next question is um, other than your book, obviously, and Vanguard that you mentioned, what are some other resources that you think that would be valuable to the folks who would like to know more? Oh yeah, that's a that's also a good question. Um, I would uh, I would say any of Martha Jones's books, her previous books, are great. Um, I think that um, I'd look at the scholarship of. Uh, Mia Bay at the scholarship of, um, there's a great book um, by Rosalind Turberg Penn on African-American women in the suffrage movement. There's a new book coming out by a scholar at UC San Diego, and I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting her name, um, also about um, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the suffrage movement. Um, if you look up the, that um, suffrage movement and um, you know, University of San Diego, I think you'll, you'll find her name. Um, I think um, I, I think that uh, there there are lots of resources out there like podcasts are doing a great job right now of um, digging in more deeply to the suffrage history moment. Um, so that would be another place I would point you to. Well, and we certainly here at Women's Rights National Historical Park and at Harriet Tubman National Historical Park will do our best to try and provide as many resources as we can. That's definitely one of our goals as well. Um, I think we're coming up on the end of our period of time here. So I want to thank you so much for being with us and again for sharing your insight and your presentation and uh, giving your time to us for these extra questions. Thank you very much for coming. Is there anything that you would like to share with our audience before we go that I haven't had a chance to ask you about today? <laughs> 
Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you so much. I'm, it's really an honor to be a part of this program. I'm happy to be here, wherever here may be. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you. And then uh, we hope that everyone will continue to join us on Facebook and YouTube for the continuation of the convention days virtual convention days 2020 commemoration uh, will wrap up tomorrow afternoon we have a, a whole another slew of programs living history and ranger talks we hope everyone will join us then we hope you'll join us as well dr free have a great afternoon <laughs>